that they would like to give you this morning. Uh, what a blessing it is to see each and every one of you here. And I would like to say happy uh, Independence Day week as we celebrate the 4th of July this week. And I'm thankful uh, as we watch this video on the Pledge of Allegiance. I I'm thankful that we live in the country that we do. And we should be patriotic because it is God that has blessed us to be able to live where we do despite the problems that we have. And uh, I, for one, having, having served my country, I'm very proud to, to be here. But I think that uh, there would be a big problem if I didn't say this. As proud as I am to be an American, as proud as I am to live in this country, I think that our patriotism needs to go much deeper uh, than the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. resident aliens. While we might be residents of the United States, our permanent home as Christians is the kingdom of heaven, and that's where our patriotism should truly lie. So as we are patriotic today, let us be patriotic first and foremost to the kingdom of heaven. America, like every other nation on earth, is only a temporary place, uh, but the kingdom of heaven is one that will never fall. So let us be thankful that we serve a God who is so gracious and so good has allowed us not only to be resident, but to be citizens of such a wonderful kingdom. Let us pray this morning as we continue with our worship service. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today to be able to come here and to freely worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us uh, with the opportunity to live in the country that we do. Uh, despite the problems that it has, Lord, it is the greatest place to live on earth. Father, we also pray this morning that as we come here before you, that our allegiance not ultimately be set on the United States, but ultimately on the God who has saved us from a bondage to sin. Lord, we thank you for being so good to people who so do not deserve it. Lord, we thank you for being gracious. We thank you for loving people like us who are unlovable in every way, yet, Lord, you have cast your affections upon us and sent your son to die for us. And Lord, for that we are eternally grateful. We thank you, Lord, that we can walk here as residents of the United States, but ultimately as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. For that we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay with us, please.
if you would open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of 1 Samuel. We have finally completed our series on the Gospel of Mark, and today we're going to begin a new series, the book of 1 Samuel. And the book of 1 Samuel is exciting. I am excited about this because it is fascinating, and through the lives, the, the flawed lives, I might add, of people like Hannah and Samuel and Saul and David, we will learn remarkable things about the character of God. And that's what's so great about this book, as is every book of the Bible. Today we're going to look specifically at 1 Samuel chapter 1. And this morning I want to speak to you on the subject of facing adversity. Adversity is something that all of us deal with in life. It's something that everyone goes through. And I guess how you deal with adversity or how you view your own troubles sometimes is a result on the perspective that you put it into. I, I remember hearing a story about a man who went to the doctor. And the doctor looked at that man and he said, Sir, I, I hate to tell you this, I, I don't have good news today. I have bad news and I have worse news. And the man said, Well, doctor, give me the bad news first. What is it? And the doctor said, Well, you, the bad news is you've got 24 hours to live. And he said, If that's the bad news, what's the worst news? And he said, The worst news is I forgot to tell you yesterday. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's bad news, isn't it? That's bad news. And I think the problems that we have sometimes pale in comparison when we put them in perspective the bigger problems that other people have. But still, adversity is one of those things that all of us deal with. Some of us look at our problems in different ways. I remember reading somewhere that a fog bank that covers seven city blocks and is 100 feet deep is, is uh, full of the amount of water that can be contained in less than one cup. That's how much water is in an entire fog bank. Yet it causes problems for the whole city. It causes traffic jams. It causes wrecks and many other things. And I think that that might be a good analogy uh, concerning the adversity that we face in life. Because I think sometimes we let ourselves get up in arms. I think sometimes we face a lot of unnecessary sorrow because of what really amounts to less than a cup full of trouble. And that's what I want us to look at today because we're going to see the story of a woman named Hannah and how she dealt with adversity. And the, the first person I want to introduce you to as this story opens is her husband. When we look at, at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to see that the secret to handling adversity is how you approach it. Now that's going to be the, the most important part of this passage this morning. If, if you're going to remember anything, once we get into this passage, I want you to see how trouble is approached. But as this story opens up in 1 Samuel chapter 1, the first man that we're introduced to is a man that lived in a part of Israel called Ramah, and his name was Elkanah. Now, Elkanah uh, was a man who was of some means. I, I say that he was of some means because he basically supported two families. He had two wives, and uh, it's got to take some means just to do that, does it not? He was able to uh, provide offerings for his wives and for all of his children as they went to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was every year. Elkanah was a godly man, at least to some extent. I don't know the extent of his relationship with the Lord, but I know that he feared the Lord by, by reading the scriptures. I know that he considered worship in the temple to be something very important for him and his family. Uh, at that time, the temple, was, or excuse me, the tabernacle was in a place called Shiloh. This was before uh, Israel had set up Jerusalem as its capital, it's before the, the temple had been built. And the resting place at this time for the tabernacle was a place called Shiloh. And that's where he would take his family to worship as they would make sacrifices before the, the Lord. But even though Elkanah was a godly man, or I should say a man who did fear God, there was a serious problem with his life. Now, this is not going to be the main point of the story today, but I think it's important to note this because I think sometimes we fail to see it. We say, what is the problem that he had? Well, the problem was that he had two wives. Now, in this day and age, you can see why that might be a problem. 
But you look back at the Old Testament era and you say, well, why was it a problem for Elkanah to have two wives? After all, we see other godly men in Scripture that had two wives. And the Bible praises those men. We see men like Abraham, although one was really a concubine. You know, we see Jacob who had two wives. Uh, we see David who had more than one wife. Solomon, while he had many problems, he had a multitude of wives. And we ask ourselves if there were people in Scripture that were godly men, that were praised for their love for the Lord, why do we want to point our finger at Elkanah and say there was a problem with him having two wives? Well, the problem was that was never God's plan from the start that anybody had two wives. And while people like Abraham uh, were praised and David and Jacob, it was never praised fact that they had two wives. As a matter of fact, those issues never really caused them anything other than problems. So let me say first of all that this man, while he was a godly man, his life was compromised in a serious way. And that is because he had two wives. Now I want to move on and talk about those wives because it's on one of those wives that this story centers. Uh, one of the wives was a woman named Penina. Now, Penina was a woman who had uh, born many children for him. She had sons, and she had daughters. And the other wife was one whose name was Hannah. Hannah, it appears, was his favorite wife because in verse 5, the Bible tells us that to Hannah he would give a double portion because he loved Hannah. Now, that doesn't mean that he did not love uh, his other wife, Penina, as he loved Hannah. Hannah had uh, a different circumstance in her life than Penina had. She was barren. She was not able to have children. And it says that he loved her so much while the Lord had closed her womb that he gave her a double portion, something that he wasn't required, obligated, or even expected to do. His love for her compelled him to give a double portion. Uh, Hannah was the love of his life. She was a woman who wanted to have children. Having children was a, a sign of dignity. It was a sign of respect. It was an honorable thing to have children. And she was not able to do so. And not only was Hannah not able to have children, but her husband had another wife. The, the man that she was supposed to be closest to, the, the one who, who she should be intimately united with, she can't confide in as she should be because he has another wife, and that other wife provoked her. And it says even when they went to the tabernacle for offering of years, that's when she would truly provoke her. She would really provoke her during these times. And it was a constant source of trouble for Hannah, the fact that Penina would provoke her. She, she basically rubbed it in her face that she had children while Hannah didn't. She used it as as a wedge, trying to uh, wedge between Hannah and Elkanah and elevate herself because she had children for him while the other one did not. So these are the problems that are, are that are going on in, Her in, in, in Hannah's life. Now, I want to point something out about Hannah before we move on and talk about what she did as a result of the problem. The problem that she had was that she was barren. And it was not an honorable thing to not have children. It was a very honorable thing to have children. But I want to point out, as you look at the broader landscape of Scripture, that the Lord has done some very wonderful things through women who have been barren. If you go back to Abraham and Sarah, uh, Sarah thought she would never be able to have children, but she had a child who was not only a blessing as a child from the Lord, he was a child through whom the promises of God would come true. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you look at um, Jacob's wife, Rachel, uh, Rachel was barren, but then had uh, a child who turned out to be a, a wonderful uh, blessing and who, who saved Israel from the famine in the land of Canaan. Uh, you look at people um, that... Uh, that have been blessings all the way through up until the New Testament. We see 
Well, we see the story of Mary who it doesn't say that she was barren, but the fact that she had a child having not ever knew a man, she was in a place where she couldn't have children, yet she would give birth to one who was going to be a great one, who would be our Savior, the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we look at Elizabeth, her cousin, who gave birth to John the Baptist. We see store, scriptures full of people who were barren through whom God has done wonderful and mighty things. But let me point out what the source of her problem was. What is it that caused the problem? What is it that caused the adversity in Hannah's life? Now that's really what I want to deal with this morning. Because we all find ourselves surrounded by problems. And each of us have different problems. Some people have, have ailing health. Some people have handicaps of one kind or another. Some people have bankruptcy issues. Other people have relationships that are failing. But what we do when we look at our problems, we say, what caused all of this? What is the source of the problems? And usually we point the blame to whatever that source is, don't we? And usually we have some kind of resentment. We have some kind of a problem with whatever it is that caused our problem. Because if it weren't for that, we wouldn't be going through the situation that we're in. Is that not right? Well, I want you to see what caused Hannah's problem. Because Hannah could have been a person that was full of bitterness. She could have been a person that was full of resentment, but she wasn't. We're going to see that in a minute. But I want you to see what caused her problem. Look at verse 5. To Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her, although the Lord had closed her womb. Her problem was that she was barren. What was the source of that problem? Was she barren because she was just disrespectful and living an ungodly life? Was she barren uh, because she had done something to put herself in a position physically to not have children? No, she was barren because the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 6, and her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable. Why? You see, Tanita wasn't the source of the problem. She was provoking her, but the source of the problem was that the Lord had closed her womb. So we ask ourselves, what was the source of Hannah's problem? source was God himself. Her problems weren't traced back to Penina, the one who provoked her. Her problems are traced back to the Lord, the very one who had closed her womb, the very one who had made her barren, the very one who had not given her the ability to have children. And isn't this the question that skeptics all around the world ask? You know, if there really is a good God, why would he let his people endure things such as this. Now, this is a problem that people have with Christianity, isn't it? People say, if God were good, why would, he, why would he let people go through these kinds of things? Why would he let his people suffer? Why would uh, he let children starve to death in Africa? Why would God let all of the, the chaos and all of the turmoil in the world happen? And when we ask that question, we need to look at Hannah's response. Because God himself, while he caused Hannah's barrenness, he had a reason for which she did not know, a reason for which she could not conceive in her mind for allowing her, for bringing her through these troubled times. And maybe, just maybe, God's purpose in bringing her through these troubles was greater than the purpose that she had in her mind or having children right away. And it's possible. It's possible that your problems, whatever they may be, whether it be your health, your finances, your relationships, it's possible that God has within your problems a purpose that's greater than that which you know. So, first of all, let me ask you this. What is the cause of Hannah's problems? It says here that God himself is the one who closed her womb. Therefore, God was the source of her problems. But I'm not trying to put blame on God. I'm trying to give glory to God because I want you to see how Hannah responded to this situation. I want you to look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Well, I hate to answer that question, but apparently he wasn't. Amen. Because she's grieving over the fact that she doesn't have a child. But anyway, 
He goes on to say, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow, and she said, O oh, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. I want you to look at how Hannah responded to her problem, because my encouragement, my hope, my prayer for all of us is that we handle our adversity the way that Hannah handled her adversity. How did she do it? She rolled her burden onto the Lord. She was provoked. She was bitter. She was in anguish. In anguish, the Bible says. But yet she urged the Lord. And look at how she approaches the Lord as she goes to the tabernacle at Shiloh. And she prays to the Lord in verse 11 says that she said, O oh Lord of hosts. She responds to him as Yahweh, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Yahweh, the Lord, O oh Lord of hosts. In other words, as she looks up to Yahweh and prays, she recognizes that, that he is not only the God of Israel, the God who has created heaven and earth, he is the Lord of hosts. He is the commander of every member of the armies of heaven. All of the armies of heaven are under his command. And she recognizes that as she calls him the Lord of hosts. And then she says to the Lord, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. She's not asking him to do anything, to, to right wrongs that have been done in her life. She's not asking him to um, recognize that she has been given a, a wrongful lot in life in some way. What she's having him do, what she's asking him to do, is to look upon her affliction. God, look upon my sorrow. And this is what I'm asking you to do. Remember me, God. Whatever reason I'm going through all of this for, I know that I'm pain in pain, and I know that I'm in anguish, but all I'm asking you to do, God, is to remember me, to look down upon my situation and to remember me. May, may this situation glorify you. She goes on to ask him, don't forget me, but I'm asking you if you will give me a male child. Isn't that the story? Isn't that what the problem was? She was barren. She could not have children. She was provoked because of it. And she is saying, God, if you will give me a male child. Now, she's not putting God to the test. Look at what she says. If you will give me a, a male child, this is what I will do. I will give him back to you. See that? If you will give me a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She's asking for a male child. Is she asking for a male child because she's selfish? Because she always wanted a little boy that she could raise and could grow up to be the head of a family? Is, is she asking for a male child for that reason? No. She's saying, God, if you give me a male child, here's what I'll do. I'll give him right back to you. If you give me a child, I will make sure that this child, as he comes into the world, that his mission will be to glorify you in all that he does. She says, I will give him back to you. No razor shall touch his head. Now, you and I may think, well, that's not a very nice thing, is it, to keep a razor from touching your child's hair? Uh, don't you know that boys aren't supposed to grow up with long hair? I mean, that's, that doesn't look right, does it? No. She's saying that no razor shall touch his head because in saying that, she is taking a vow on behalf of her son. And you see in the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses talks to the people of Israel, he talks about a vow that people would make before the Lord called the Nazarite vow. And a Nazarite was somebody who was set aside for the purposes of the Lord for a certain period of time. You know, you had prophets who were called by God uh, to do their job. You had priests who were called by God. You had kings that were called by God. But a Nazarite was usually called for a specified period of time 
The sheep here says all the days of his life. And whenever a Nazarite would take that vow, they weren't to cut their hair for as long as they were fulfilling that service to the Lord. Uh, no razor shall touch their head. As a matter of fact, there were several things, several prohibitions in the Nazarite vow. But in keeping that vow, they were recognized as a special group of people who had been set aside for a certain purpose. And she says, God, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. I will make sure that he is raised for your glory, that he is set aside for your purposes and for your purposes alone. Hannah was not being selfish and asking for a child. She was not asking God to simply fulfill her greatest desire so she could have that satisfaction in life of rearing a child. She says, God, I will give him back. You know, let's, let's be honest for a moment. As we look at this story, I think that we're a lot more selfish than Hannah was also. I mean, we're selfish with our children. We're selfish with our lives. Can you imagine God giving you a child and you just giving him right back? I mean, I can't imagine giving a new car back. I can't imagine giving many things back. There are many things in life that I would just dream about having. And I know in my selfish nature, it would be difficult for me to let go of those things if I ever received them. I don't want to be that way, but if I'm going to be honest, I know that I just know that it would. Hannah says, I'm asking for the greatest thing that I could ever receive, and you give that, I'm giving him right back to you. That's what I want to do, Lord. Hannah gave her burden to the Lord, and I want you to see what happened. Verse 17. As she had been praying to the Lord, she had been speaking, but no words had been coming out of her mouth. Eli the priest was watching her, and he thought she was drunk. He had no idea what this lady was doing. He thought she was a crazy woman. But he realized that she was praying, and she says to him in verse 16, Don't consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of your abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition of which you have asked him. And he said, and she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And here's what I want you to see in verse 17. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She had now found joy. She was bitter. She was in anger. After she turned her sorrow over to the Lord, it says that she went away and that she ate 